All right, you guys, now let's get started so we can keep it on schedule. Looks like we lost quite a few soldiers to the expo outside, so we'll keep it short and sweet. But what I wanted to talk to you today about specifically is omnichannel and all the conversations that we're having within the market and what we've learned, all the different studies and interactions that we've had with various analysts and gather all that information and put it in front of you. So hopefully you can use that to help guide your presentations to your customers, to help guide your consulting, and to help guide what you do with your implementations. You'll notice that even though the presentation is about omnichannel, um, I tell them what the future is made of. And the reason why I'm looking at it that way in terms of two components, the retail interaction component, which is what happen what's happening these days on the retailer side of things, and the customer engagement, which is what's happening in the retailer's stores and what's happening from the customer point of view. And that's truly are the two sides to omnichannel. At the end of the day, when it comes to retail, retail is at the heart of it all. And back in the day, getting the best silks from the market was far less about the trip to the market and far more about the personal relationship with the merchant that those shoppers had so they knew that that merchant can go on their travels and can source those silks, silks and fabrics and spices and bring it to them. And not very many things changed. Even though we are in 2014, it's all about fulfillment on desire, fulfillment on the desire that every retailer has to express their brand. It's fulfillment on the desire that consumers have to express what makes them unique through the products that they use, through things that they purchase at various retail and establishments. So at the end of the day, it's all about shrinking that gap between what it is that consumers desire and what it is retailers can provide. Providing it faster, provided, providing it with much more targeted understanding of who they're dealing with and how can they um, truly improve what they're doing and where. And I look at those two components and I look at the, how they're evolving in the market today. And there are a lot of numbers, and I, actually that's why I brought the iPad, because I really wanted to make sure that I give you all the data that is out there. We're looking at uh, numbers, even though omnichannel expectation is becoming the norm. Are we ready? Are we ready to hit those two marks and bring omnichannel to the market? And a part of the study that we looked at was in crossing European and North American markets. And we looked at about 300 retailers, scale retailers. And about one third of them said, yeah, we've got at least some sort of omni-channel oriented processes in place or some sort of omni-channel products that we're trying to implement. One third. That means that two thirds are not even to the consideration stage yet. And yet we're seeing that consumers are expecting that now. And it is the consumer expectation that is driving that. So it was easy before. Back in the day, it was all about a single channel. It was easy because when it comes to retail, it's, it's a great way to deliver a personal experience because we all want that interaction. We all want to understand what the shoppers want. And when the retailer interacted through the, with the consumer through a single channel and the consumer experienced the retailer's brand through a single channel, it was easy to control that delivery and to make that experience perfect. Problem, however, as we all know, it doesn't scale very well. The cost of sale is very high. Crossing borders becomes more difficult. Repeating that experience becomes more difficult because training the demands, especially luxury brands, when they're trying to control the experience to a T and making sure that experience is the same, regardless whether it's being delivered in Paris, in Tokyo, on somewhere in Bangkok. So retailers evolved they added channels, went to the multi-channel. And today we're seeing just about every customer we deal with, they have at the very least an e-commerce solution. At the very least, they're employing m-commerce somewhere. They're tying into loyalty platforms. But what we're seeing is the limitations are still plenty because even though the retailer is starting to see the benefits of having the systems be connected, the consumers are still seeing the disjointed efforts. It's been a while since I've experienced that, but um, at one point, I remember buying something online, going back to the retailer's store, and they're like, well, sorry, we don't take the returns for online purchases in our store. Same brand, same everything, but the systems were not integrated, so therefore, they were not able to assist me. And when there are plenty of opportunities of where to shop and how to shop, it burns to the customers. It kind of puts a nice little ding into the relationship, and it's something that the retail as a whole has been working on and making sure that we could provide that seamless experience. So we're seeing that majority of the markets that we're, where we work, 
multi-channel is starting to move into the thing of the past, into a definitely stable thing of the past, and the retailers are moving to that, the ways that they can deliver on that need to deliver product now, to deliver fulfillment now. They're integrating systems so they can fulfill from stores. If I come into the store and I say, I want this shirt, but I want it in pink, can you get it to me? And a lot of the consumers are acting exactly this way. And we're finding that as many as half of them, they've already done their research. They already know that, yeah, that product does exist in that color or does exist in my size. It's just not available at this location. Can you fulfill it? And a lot of retailers are caught between in this paradigm of, do I have the right tools at the right time to be able to guide that fulfillment process? And a lot of talks have been going on about online giants, Amazon. Amazon's spanning quite a few geographies right now. But what Amazon doesn't have is a local store. And I wanted to give you a, quite a little number to consider. Amazon has Amazon Prime membership. It's a program that allows them to fulfill orders faster. It basically guarantees a, um, expedited shipping on everything you purchase. Huge company, has been doing business for a while. Last holiday season, they expanded their Prime membership by one million people. Even though they're mature, they've been in the market, they've grown by a million in a matter of two months. So consider how many sales did not happen at the local store that happened on Amazon. Purely because of the convenience factor, purely because of the desire for that immediate fulfillment and the ability to say, okay, I'm gonna buy it now, it's gonna be on my do doorstep tomorrow. But what if the local store could do that? What if the local store had the tools to say, okay, I have six stores in the region, and I don't really have to fulfill from a warehouse that's located somewhere far away. I can say, I know exactly where you live, my dear customer, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fulfill from the local store and drop ship it to you. Or I'm going to use a local delivery service. I don't know if any of you use, but eBay Local started this delivery program. They can deliver it that same day. If I order it in the morning, I can, it can be on my doorstep when I get home from work. Those things have been taking off, and when it comes to things, especially like showrooming, the local store becomes the differentiator for a lot of brands. It becomes that point of engagement and that point where they can deliver the service and differentiate themselves from purely online players. They can differentiate themselves from stores and brands that are still stuck in the, in the ways of the past and unable to move as fast, to fulfill as fast. So they're starting to move towards cross-channel, towards that integration, towards the multitude of fulfillment possibilities and opportunities for conversion, opportunities for connection. So the consumers in that point are starting to realize that, okay, I'm starting to see the brand as it's coming across all the different channels. I see the websites, I see the mobile apps, I see sometimes content aisle type of initiatives. Um, in fact, let me give you a, a nice little metric um, that I find very, very interesting. So as far as the cross-channel goes, as many as 72% of consumers over the course of the last year that was surveyed as part of the study that was done, once again, um, this one was North America only, but 71% um, of consumers pre-shopped every sale online. And yet what we're seeing is that our retailers are still attributing sales to one channel or the other. Is it worthwhile for me to invest in online? Is it worthwhile to invest into in-store mobile? But where is the sale going to? Is it actually attributed to one or are they actually trying to understand what is the total value of that consumer to my brand? And what can I do with them? So this is the industry ideal, quite honestly, that exists today. The most progressive retailers out there are leveraging all the various store pickup options, are starting to enable the store clerks to be able to have the tools to not only cross-sell, to not only assist in um, clientele and kind of things, or line busting, or make the experience more seamless. They're actually starting to become shipping experts, service experts, personal shopping experts. I know I'm a huge fan of uh, Nordstrom. The other day I was at uh, one of their outlet stores and they were able to pull up all my shopping history from the actual Nordstrom brand and were able to recommend matching products and whatnot. Love it. Makes it absolutely seamless because to me it's still a Nordstrom brand. So with that, 
we're able to tell a story deeper and make more meaningful connections. And it's, it's interesting, because we're seeing a lot of retail brands are starting to capitalize on that, from with Shoes with a Conscious at Tom's to different environmentally friendly initiatives that the retailers are starting up and really communicating their brand through that to um, Patagonia, an outdoor retailer who's actually a retail for a customer. They, um, last holiday season, right before um, the Christmas shopping rush starts right around Thanksgiving time in US, they launched a campaign that included a nearly 30 minute long movie about how they want their trusted customers to recycle and reuse their products and their jackets instead of buying new ones on sale. So consider that. A retailer who is advocating less waste and putting that image and putting that message more on a, on a level higher than simply capturing revenue. Advocacy becomes important. So how we can play a role in that advocacy, how can we give them tools and enable them to talk about that and to enable them to really give more to retail than purely a transaction point. That's what's important. Interesting little infographic, and you're probably wondering why there's five iPhones on there. And the reason why there's five is because four out of five consumers right now are shopping on their phones. That's a fact. If a consumer has a mobile phone, they, four out of five are shopping on it. Whether it be flash sale sites, whether it be curated sites, whether it be specific designated locators um, for various retailers, whether it be the actual retailer's apps, but they're using it. Loyalty programs are spanning up. So if I'm traveling to a new region, like for example, when we arrived here in New Orleans, we wanted to find a place to, to, to eat. So we were looking at, okay, what various locations exist. Retailers are leveraging it the same way. Um, there's a retailer in San Francisco that uses iBeacon technology. And what they're doing is they're pushing offers to various consumers who are in the vicinity of the store communicating to them about the value of the product, communicating to them the brand story. And they're seeing an incredible lift in sales purely because they're able to add another channel and transcend that border and make that connection. The content aisle is definitely on the rise. A lot of retailers are starting to move past purely outlining products and really starting to put it into context for retailers. Um, I'm a huge fan of an app called House. They have a website and they have an app for iOS devices, Androids, whatever, that what they do is they post very editorially heavy and photography heavy posts with interior design projects, with uh, various decorating ideas for the yard projects and things like that. But they're not just a pretty picture. They're not just a magazine. They cross index everything and they tag products. So you can with a one click of a mouse or just by touching your iPad, purchase that lamp. Reference that color so you're able to go to your local paint store and pick it up. You're able to shop within an app. And we're seeing that spread across the entire specialty retail sector right now. This happens to be a screenshot of an um, of a anthropology store app. Um, Nordstrom is huge in that. They have um, their in-style section is basically an editorially heavy curated style guide with everything being cross-indexed, with everything that you can share with your fellow shoppers, you can share it with your friends, you can post it to social media, or you can purchase from there as well. So the adding value through channels, we see that is going to be the huge differentiator because the, the consumers are moving past wanting just the product. They're wanting that relationship, and they're wanting that consistent relationship across the entire spectrum of channels where they touch those consumers. And you'll notice that that's Prism. And the reason why that's there is because what about retailers' tools? Because everything we've talked about until now is, OK, I am the consumer. I'm going to find this through the consumer-facing app. But what about the retailer tools? And what we find is that across all the markets where we are active, which is quite a few markets, about 70% of consumers expect that the retailer is armed with a mobile device. And at the same time, I look at my personal shopping experiences, and not even two weeks ago, I walk into J. Crew and they have a tablet dusting on the corner. So, professional curiosity, I asked them about it. And come to find out, they implemented it about a year ago in that particular store, and it never really worked. The process never really worked for them. So, it ends up sitting in the corner and collecting dust instead of being used, instead of being used to express the brand and give those tools to the 
clerks so they're more educated than the consumers. Because we do our research. We know what we're looking for. If you're going to a store to look at a new bike, you probably, and you are into biking, you probably looked about at all the frames, at all the components, and you know exactly what you're looking for. You don't want to find that your store associates or a store associates in the stores of your retailers are more knowledgeable than your salespeople. You want them to evangelize the products. They want you, they, you want them to be able to tell the story and connect. And for that, they need tools. And they need to know who you are. We have a customer, um, Aesop, they do cosmetics. And cosmetics are an interesting industry. They release lots and lots of colors every season. Not too many women in the audience, but you know what I'm talking about. And sometimes you get the most obscure names. If I told somebody about the Alpine White or Laguna Seca Blue in the automotive industry, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about because it's a pretty standard color. You can't mistake that blue for anything else. But when it comes to cosmetics, Paradise Sparkle, what the hell does that look like? And if you bought something six months ago, 12 months ago, when you get to the store and you want another of that, you better believe I'm not going to remember what was in my palette. I'm not going to remember what obscure names were on that product. So it's up to the retailer to have the right tools to be able to reference the history and said, okay, Alexandra was here eight months ago and she bought a quad and the, the four colors were. MAC, MAC Cosmetics, they use that all the time. Think about how many more meaningful interactions a retailer can have with a consumer if they understand the shopping history of who they're talking to. We don't serve the industry like the Walmarts of the world. We're not in the commodity market. We're, we are catering to people who actually like to shop and who actually want a relationship, who want to express what makes them unique, what makes their brand special. So we need to consider how do our solutions and how do our services enable them to do exactly that. And uh, didn't want to inundate you with more statistics, but numbers are kind of my thing, which is quite fun to look at them when it comes to trends. And uh, this is actually numbers that specifically look at what retailers are seeing when it comes to working on omni-channel initiatives. And I'm saying initiatives because, in my opinion, Omnichannel is still in Nirvana. It's still something far on the horizon that we look towards to that we're striving for. But as far as today, we really don't have it. However, those who are working on it, those who are starting to integrate channels and erase those operational borders, whether it be from the, the retailer side and as far as how they see and how they track metrics across the organization, how they track inventory, how they track fulfillment, or on the consumer side, do they see all the channels as part of the same brand experience? Or do they say, yep, this was this website, or was, did I buy it through this particular app, or was it a cohesive experience? At the end of the day, there are very significant benefits. As many as 88% of customers said, or of our customers, of Retail Pro customers, said that focusing on those initiatives, they saw an 88% uplift in the customer sat metrics. That's huge. And with that, the revenue is climbing. And with that, the operational efficiency is, is improving as well because less waste, faster turnarounds, actually savings on fulfillment options. So why go further? Why do we need to go and continue evolving our systems? And a lot of reasons are quite simple. And those are some of the numbers that I wanted to share. But for the most part, peer pressure is actually one of the key drivers. A lot of retailers are saying, we need to focus on omnichannel today because, well, guess what? My neighbor's doing it, and I know my competition is doing it. I don't want to be left behind. I need to continue evolving with the market. I need to continue staying relevant. So they work on it. But um, even though they're working on other different things, efficiency is still driver one, and peer pressure is driver two. So let's give them tools to actually make sense of omnichannel. So what is omnichannel today? I don't know if it's a culturally appropriate reference for all, so definitely speak up if it's not. But sometimes in US when you go to a Chinese restaurant, they have those books of menus. And you, you, you start flipping through it, and there is dozens upon dozens upon dozens of pages with lots of menu items. And they probably have items on there that get ordered once a year. If you go to a good restaurant, you usually see one page, probably five or six entrees, probably no more than 12. Very different approach. 
And omnichannel is just like that menu. It's a promise, it's a philosophy. It's out there, but defining what it's gonna be for each individual retailer, it's very personable. It's like being able to take the 155 entree list and boil it down to 15 that they do absolutely fantastically well and staying behind that. It's, and it's not gonna be the same for everyone. Some retailers might find it meaningful to interact through mobile in a particular way. Some retailers might want to do a content strategy and focus on really delivering messages for, through various value add educational initiatives. At the end of the day, the combinations are endless, but the retailer needs to decide what it is they want, what it is that makes sense for their brand story, and how are they going to transcend those borders and get there. And it's a long road ahead. Because as of today, there's a lot of retailers that we work with, a lot of retailers that I meet at different industry events that come up and say, you know what, that sounds great, but we still have major technological challenges. The integration of channels on our side, on the technology side, is still a major hurdle. So if we are going to lay that foundation for them to go into the future, we need to start helping them work on integrating those channels on erasing as many limitations and as many operational boundaries as they have. The benefits are plenty, and that's kind of a, an interesting, after all the doom and gloom of how many hurdles are still on the way, it's a very interesting metric to share. We all started out with a single channel retail, and retail was doing great, everybody was in business, everybody was happy. But when it comes to adding more channels, as more channels got added, the industry as a whole saw about 15 to 30% uplift in revenue. Those retailers who are starting to implement omnichannel, they're actually going further. They're actually seeing a 20% uplift on top of that. So that's growth like we've never seen before. And that's fantastic. It's very good news for retailers. It's a great way to justify why it's important to focus on omnichannel today so they can capture this and they can grow with it. So there are a couple comments that I wanted to um, point out that I, some initiatives that I think would be very meaningful to focus on and help our retailers to focus on. Don't wait. You might not be ready for omnichannel today. Nobody is. You might not um, have a con concrete idea for how it's going to look 24 months from now. But start integrating channels now. Start looking at how various revenue opportunities are tracked. How is your GMROI is tracked in your organization? Are you attributing it to siloed channels? Or are you actually looking at the organization as a whole? Are you looking at your customer as a, this is a customer X that goes to this store and this is this interaction, this is the same customer here interacting with me through their mobile device? Or are you actually looking at the total value and a total spend of that customer across all of your touch points and all of your various channels? You have to remain agile. You have to remain flexible because the industry is changing all the time. And that's something that Retail Pro is known for. A lot of our customers start with us when they're still young, when they're still trying to figure out who they are. We have a retailer in um, Egypt who started with us as a single store retailer attached to a factory store. It was a fabric store. So the factory was producing various prints and they started using Retail Pro to track which patterns were selling best. Then they started making garments out of it. Seven years later, there are 75 stores wide spanning 13 countries, all because they were able to stay flexible, evolve the, pro, their, the retail pro platform with them, and actually consider what can we do today? How can we make sure we look at everything from a single point of view, from a single point of authority, and truly understand what is the value of this interaction for me? What is the value of this customer for me? So what's up next for you? It's a very personal question. And you need to answer what's next for you and what's next for your retailers because that's the only way you're gonna define your strategy and the only way you're gonna figure out what is omnichannel to you. That's all I have. So if you have questions, let me know. Thank you. Yeah, Mara. I'll repeat, oh, okay. <laughs> thanks, Rick. Hey, thanks, Alexandra. Um, so regarding omnichannel, um, specifically, how do you see Retail Pro, whether Retail Pro 9 or Prism, um, 
beyond being the um, single channel solution, right? It's the brick and mortar, but it's on your, it's on your, um, uh, your desktops and now potentially on your tablets. But it's still single channel in, in effect. It's simply two different delivery systems. Sure. So how do you specifically see Retail Pro um, benefiting the retailers? Like what's the, what's the success case that, what's the pitch that you envision guys like me giving to my customers? Let me give you an example. We're working right now with a customer, Oakley. Everybody knows the, the brand. Um, they have been using Retail Pro for a number of years now. And what they're after right now is really making sure that their online presence is married to their mobile presence, is married to their store presence, so there is no borders. And they're looking at Retail Pro as, and they're treating Retail Pro as their point of authority. So we are the central depository of data. We are the central place where they track all the customer data. We're the central place that tracks all of their inventory. So, and then the information is disseminated through channels. So what they're trying to understand is this, the exact same concept of the total customer value, understanding the total inventory movement, and trying to erase those borders and make this close the loop, enable fulfillment from stores, enable pickup from stores. In fact, it's interesting um, talking about fulfillment from stores. There was a huge uptick on requests, if you will, from consumers on alternative pickup locations. So we all, we all know we can go to the store and buy something and then ship it to us later if they didn't have it. But now what we're starting to see is the layaways are growing ever more popular and Oakley is one of those. They're, doing, they're starting to prepare for making that available. So taking advantage of getting the consumer into the store and having a chance to interact with them. Um, alternative drop-off locations like post offices and local store, local corner stores kind of thing. So that's growing ever popular. So, so, so back to your question, Retail Pro is a point authority for that. That's how they choose to use it. They can choose to use it entirely differently. Um, we have a, a number of retailers that are in European markets and in the Middle East where they're using Retail Pro as a component of their omnichannel solution. So they're integrating it on the back end to the ERP, who is the point of authority for that particular retailer, but it feeds all the other content. They're cross-indexing it with their content apps that are being designed. They're tying it all through, through the entirety of the system. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? All right, great. Well, have, enjoy your lunch, and uh, we'll see you in the afternoon.